Hello, friends of the internet. My name is Austin Belzer from Austin Bay Media, and I have Alex Rappaport today, director, cinematographer, editor, and producer. Uh, let me know if I've missed anything uh, of the a documentary with Peter Bradley. Uh, it it's well, it's about Peter Bradley, the uh, a black painter who uh, has gone relatively, I would say, unrecognized. Um. Um. And just kind of deals with the um, a lot of that, uh, and it's screening at Slam Dance. I think your world premiere is at Slam Dance. Yeah. Um, so Alex, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I know that say that every time, but um, it's I, I'm loving these documentaries out of Slam Dance. I know I've been to AFI Docs. I've been to uh, Tribeca. I've been to a lot of festivals but i feel like this year with slam dance the docs have been really inventive um like uh my previous interview uh starring jerry as himself um silent love a polish documentary uh by merrick uh um i i i forget the pronunciation of his last name so i won't attempt that um but yeah that it they're really breaking boundaries uh with documentaries so um i i guess so how did you get started um how, how did you meet peter bradley first and then what made you want to make a documentary about him um well um peter and i both live in a fairly small town a couple hours north of new york city uh Saugerties, new york and uh I met Peter through a local art gallerist, Robert Langdon, who has a tiny little storefront art gallery on the main street in town where he only shows local artists. And in the summer of 2019, Robert, through a mutual friend of Peter's wife, um, cultivated a relationship and, and exhibited a handful of Peter's paintings in his little space. Um, and didn't get anybody to really pay attention, sadly. Uh, but my wife was there and met Peter. Robert introduced her as a filmmaker and Peter said, you should make a film about me. So she told me about that and then I forgot. And then six months later, my daughter was helping out at the gallery and she came home one day and said, have you heard about Peter Bradley? So I was like, okay. So I asked Robert for an introduction and met Peter exactly three years ago. And, um, he was like, yeah, let's go. You want to get your camera right now? Let's start. So I just started in my spare time when I wasn't working. I work as a cinematographer. Um, and I just started filming him when it was a good day for him and I had time. It was just super organic and easy because we're so close together. I have all the gear. That's what I do. The computer I'm talking to you now on is what I edited on. So yeah, I really was the Same only here. person. I was the only person involved. Um, including a lot of research, archival research, which took a lot of time um, up until we needed to uh, to do a, an original score. Um, and I just found Peter a really fascinating character. I mean, initially I was pulled in because he paints abstract. Um, he His technique is not with a brush. He throws buckets of paint onto canvas. So it's very action oriented and cinematic and um and i had heard some bullet points of peter's biography but when when i understood it on a deeper level i realized that that was really that was really the important story it was a more important story than i realized um and peter peter when i met him it's true had seemed to have been all but forgotten by the art world or the art market at least for decades um but up until the, the, his mid thirties, um, 1970s, he was born in 1940, he's 82 now. Um, he had attained amazing success really. Um, and so the, the odd thing was reconciling that with him being kind of this lonely figure painting, you know, kind of out in the woods as it, as it were, um, with no one paying attention. Um, Peter was the first uh, art dealer on the first black art dealer on Madison Avenue. 
uh, for a very high level art gallery that catered to movie stars and millionaires. They sold Picasso and all these early 20th century masters. And he was, if not the first, one of the first um, black modern artists, certainly of his generation, to get exhibited in a major New York gallery, Andre Emmerich, um, also on Madison Avenue in 1972. Sad to think that it it was as late as 1972 before <laughs> there were any black artists being shown in a gallery like that. Um, but, you know, at that point, you'd think he'd be all set and he had money and stylish clothes, you know, but it the the type of painting Peter does, uh, they call color field painting, which I learned was considered the third wave of abstract expressionism started by Jackson Pollock and some other star uh, artists after World War II. And by the late 70s and certainly by the mid 80s, um, it was just fell out of fashion, out of favor, and people weren't interested in buying it. So Peter and a lot of other artists that were his contemporaries had trouble selling their work. And Peter even more so, you know, I'm sure due to racism and, you know, whatever other factors might have contributed to that. Um, and uh, yeah, I just fell off the radar and bailed and came up here. <laughs> so uh, he's just a, he was just a cool guy. I mean, the best part of it was just hanging out with him. And that's why I called the film with Peter Bradley, because the whole experience of it is just this very intimate um, portrait where it was the two of us the whole time. Um, I was working alone and uh, he's just very open and has a nice sense of humor. And also it's refreshing to see an artist talk about their art with a complete lack of pretension about it. You know, it's just, he really approaches it more as a craft. And um, so, yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> that's a long winded answer for you. <laughs> no worries. Um, and I I think that's a perfect answer. In fact, you've already eliminated some of my interview questions. <laughs> uh, but you know, you spend uh, to key on 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 the title. Like you said, it it does feel like a hangout session. You know, there's so many shots of just close close up shots of Peter just pouring the paint on the, on the um, canvas and just watching it, just mm -hmm. waiting and explaining. Oh. I, I add water to this because it doesn't look right if I don't do it this way or, you know, it gets certain um, patterns that you wouldn't get if you did it without uh, th this water. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's very cool. I mean, and to that, to, in thinking of it that way, there's also this temporal um, aspect to his work where it changes once the paint goes down. And Peter, Peter uses water-based paint, acrylics, and then dilutes them heavily with water. So it's it's almost like just colored water um, when he puts it on the canvas. And so the effect is, and 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 before he even puts that down, he saturates the canvas over and over just with water to get it completely drenched where the, where the pores of the canvas are just filled. It's just soaking. And so when the pigment goes down, it, it, he describes it as a staining effect. So if you look at a lot of his paintings up close, you realize the paint isn't on the surface. It's, it's dyed in. It's like dyed the canvas. And you're looking at the actual weave of the canvas. It's it's really cool to look at up close. And so they almost work more like watercolors as he puts different layers of paint on and they they run and blend together. Um, it has this very cool um, cloud-like vibe to it um, that's different every time he, he makes something. Yeah, and speaking to that difference, there's two really cool scenes, I think, in this documentary where you get it insight into his artistic process where he's got this big canvas and he's just cutting it down, cutting it down. And the, uh, and at first he takes this one section and he's like, uh, I forget the exact quote, but he says, Oh, that's useless basically. Yeah. And then like five minutes later, he's like, wait a minute, I think I see something here <laughs> or, or, um, when he's outside, he, um, I think he, I, I forget what the official process is of it. Um, 
but when his paint dries up, it leaves these little um, double-sided kind of mini portraits that he can just kind of st st uh, stick on to other paintings he's already been working on. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, and everything you're describing, uh, it's really remarkable. I didn't realize how remarkable until I started showing rough cuts to people for feedback. Um, and people that are involved in the arts were telling me, like, you don't realize how incredible it is that an artist would let you film them while they're doing all their stuff. You know, they they tend to be very guarded about that, you know, secretive, like the trade, trade secrets, right? About how they get certain effects. And Peter, Peter was thinking about that. He talked about it a little bit, but then he he basically his attitude was, well, you know, at this point in my life, you know, I, I, if people are copying me, you know, what have I got to lose? And plus what I told him is, well, here I am, I'm documenting that you're the originator, you know, of what you're doing. So if people copy you, it'll be very clear who they're, who they're imitating. Um, but yeah, that what you're describing with the cutting the canvas, um, he calls it cropping. Um, and that turns out to be a technique that's um, associated with this art critic that, that Peter was friends with and mentions, uh, his name is Clement Greenberg, who's a, a sort of a, a legendary art critic um, in America. It was kind of credited with making Jackson Pollock, um, Helen Frankenthaler into these big stars in the art world in the, in the 1950s. Um, and his daughter, I, I'll just tell you as a sidebar that I, I've been in touch with Clement Greenberg's daughter, Sarah, who's a few years older than me, who remembers Peter as a child, very fondly hanging out with her dad. And she saw the film and, and really loves it. Um, and what she said is like, you know, that scene where he's taping and marking the canvas, she said, that's like totally what my dad did with a lot of these artists. It's a very Clement Greenberg kind of thing where they just look at it. I mean, you know, he throws paint down on these big canvases and you don't know what's gonna happen. And he puts it on a wall and it's like, well, huh, you know, where is it really working? Where is it interesting to me? Where can I find that picture that's that's the right picture? And uh, so, yeah, he'll, he'll tape it out and then cut it up. And then there's big pieces of canvas that he didn't think worked well and he, he he saves those, or at least was at the time, because canvas is expensive. Um, and he'll take like strips of it and then staple it down next to bigger canvases in the studio and just kind of do the patch, just throw the paint over the patchwork. And maybe some of the smaller pieces wind up looking cool, uh, just like the big one. You know, it's kind of it's kind of cool. It's sort of frugal in one way, but also just very um you know, again, it kind of takes it back to a craft of like, well, these are these techniques and how to be efficient with the materials. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very insightful for someone like me who can barely do stick figures. So it, <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'm never going to be able to do that, but that's awesome. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. And talking a bit more about the artistic process because that's what interests me so much about this film is just how deep it goes. Mm. Um, you know, there, there's so much I could talk about. Um, <laughs> you know, there's this jazz to, the, to it that um, that is interesting because you, when you see him painting, it's like you see him painting to the rhythm and you're like, wait a minute, what? Um, and I was going to yeah. ask um, Javon Jackson, the composer. Um, yeah, Javon, Javon did Javon. an amazing job. I mean, music, jazz, jazz music in particular is really kind of a B story in the film. Um, Peter, from the time, from time he was a child, um, not only listened to a lot of the jazz classics um, in the 50s, and late 40s growing up, but he met a lot of these A-list musicians, Miles Davis, Art Blakey, and others, um, because they stayed in his mom's 
house. She had sort of this rooming house. Um, Peter grew up in this uh, town in Pennsylvania uh, outside of Pittsburgh where the two different train lines sort of intersected and people would have to somehow sometimes wait till the next morning to get the train into Pittsburgh. And um, his dad worked on the train line and would meet these musicians. And at that time, a lot of the hotels were segregated. And so it was kind of that green book era. And mm -hmm. so he'd be like, hey, you can stay at our house, you know, right up the hill from the train station. Um, and so he got to be friends, friends with these guys and, and developed a passion for the music that continues. And even as a child would, would always draw and paint listening to the records. And so that's still how he works. Um, he puts on music, has these big, huge vintage like horns um, in his studio and in the house and um, cranks it up and, and paints. Um, I had, when I was editing, the, the, the temporary music I used while editing were lifted from all these classic CDs that he had lying around the studio. I mean, it was just, you know, it was incredible. Um, of course, I couldn't afford to use all those tracks. It cost like $15,000 a piece or something. Um, so fortunately, Javon Jackson, I was introduced to through Peter's wife, Deborah, um, about a year and a half ago. And there's a great story there too, uh, because Peter has known Javon since the late 1980s. Um, when Javon was right out of Berkeley School of Music and got a job as a sax player with Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. And Peter was buddies with Art Blakey and went to every show he could when they were in the city and so met Javon and got to be friends with him. So um, uh, I had seen a concert Javon did, his, his quartet, in the summer of 2021. 20, and uh, afterward, Deborah said, hey, I've got this great idea. Don't you think Javon would do a great job doing the music for the film? And I said, yes. And Javon watched the film and loved it. Actually came to appreciate, came to know Peter on a whole other level than he had previously because they used to only talk about music together. He never talked about art, you know, with the, the jazz guys. So Javon heard all the tracks I had used on the temp and internalized it and then created amazing original tracks sort of inspired by that and then beyond. Um, it's really a character in the film. Uh, I'd love to do a soundtrack album if we can get some money or interest to do that. Yeah, that'd be awesome because, and, um, because as soon as John Coltrane came on, I was like, and then I actually did some digging into uh, Javon uh, and I found out that he recorded uh, some of Coltrane's music. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Um, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's it's interesting you, you point that out. So there's a lot of places in the film where you're hearing some of these some of this music in in the moment, as they say, um, because Peter was playing records and talking about them or whatever. You you know, I couldn't tell him turn the music down while I'm filming you. You know, he had to do it, and I'm I'm still hoping that. Uh, we're, we're clinging to a fair use um, determination uh, from my lawyer that, that, that we'll be okay to use those moments. Um, we'll see what happens. Friends of mine that work in the music business are like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But uh, for now, you know, I've got the errors and omissions insurance. We'll, we'll be okay for a while. <laughs> as long as it's not owned by Universal, you're, I think you're good because <laughs> I did... I, I, I tried this thing a few months ago or not. Yeah. A few months ago where I was going to um, listen to all the new music that had popped up in my Spotify account um, that Friday. And I guess I listened to some universal music and I put it on YouTube and they're like, yeah, this is a universal music. You can't use this. Right. You have to mute it. And it's like, okay. And it's always universal. That's the copyright claimant um yeah. on uh youtube it's never like in uh not, not nbc uh uh disney or anything like that like yeah. you'd think yeah we'll have to see what happens you know with any luck you know we'll get some interest and we'll be able to pay for those things <laughs> if and when you know yeah um um 
And I, I kind of want to talk a, a little bit um, about, um, since this is so much about the artistic process, um, first, what what inspires you about painting? Um, or what, I'm sorry, what interests you about painting? And then what what are your inspirations for either the movie or just your style? Well, you know, I'm not really, uh, I don't really know all that much about art and I didn't get interested. You know, I hadn't, I hadn't heard about Peter or read about him and, and thought, oh, this, you know, would be a great subject. I, I just met him and instantly liked him. And I saw his paintings and thought, well, that's cool. <laughs> you know, um, so I, I really, I was inspired on it on, on, you know, just a personal level in terms of that, the chemistry I had with Peter. I mean, I, it was really exciting for me how he, he was just a great subject, you know, from the first time I filmed him, the first thing I did with him was just sit him out, sit him down to do a rambling interview um, just so I could see, it was almost like a screen test, really. I wanted to see how he was on camera. You know, some people, they get fidgety or they look at the camera a lot, you know, um, or they don't maintain eye contact. I mean, it, it can really make a difference to how they come across. And Peter was just focused and kind of even his energy got even better when the camera was turned on. And he always was looking. He never looked at the camera once. I don't think the whole time. I, I kid you not, I can't think of one time in all the footage of him over days and days and hours where I caught him look at the lens. It's really crazy when yeah. you think about it. Um, but uh, I, I, yeah, I was just inspired by Peter and his story and and what he does, you know? I just, I liked hanging out. And so I hung out with the camera. I, I'm, it may be a little disappointing, you know, that I don't have a more intellectual. Uh, no, that's a great answer, answer but, yeah. because I think it, <laughs> I think it kind of, in a way, perfectly describes the film. Um, mm. Because it's just a hangout movie. You're just for a lot <laughs> of the documentary, you're just watching mm. somebody paint, um, yeah. and then like, occasionally you'll get into the archival bits where you're talking about. Um, he worked at um, this museum. And uh, somebody said, oh, you can't hang that from there. And then he proceeds yeah. to hang it from the yeah. centerpiece well, or something right. like that. And, I mean, it wasn't any museum. It was the Guggenheim Museum. And the piece That's he right. was hanging was a, a master work by Alexander Calder in 1964. Um, and uh, first of all, Peter thinks he was the first black professional to work in the Guggenheim, which is amazing. Um, it got hired there in 1963, and um, but his tenure there was short-lived because he helped. He he worked on the crew that installed the exhibits, and when Alexander Calder saw how he hung his thing from the rotunda, which they had never done before, he told his art art dealer to give Peter a job, and that was Pearl's Galleries on Madison Avenue. And they initially hired Peter just to work on Calder's, like to put them together and and go over to France to Calder Studio to get the stuff and bring it over or to repair them and paint them. But after a couple of years, they realized he was so sharp um, and knew so much about art um, that they promoted him to be the associate director of the galleries. So he was selling paintings to celebrities like Paul McCartney. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of crazy. But you know, that what, what come, I think it's easy to understand anyone that watches the film even though they're seeing Peter in advanced age, you get that he's just the kind of person that people would want to be around, you know, just like I wanted to be around him. I mean, when he was young and full of, you know, vim and vigor, I mean, it was probably even more so. Um, so I'm sure he was a great salesman of art, you know, and just talk to people. And so, yeah, a lot of, a lot of personality. Yeah, for sure. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think people really should check out this film. Um, if you're in Park City, Utah, uh, it, it's playing Saturday, J January twenty second at twelve forty five p.m. Yeah, what? Sunday, 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 January twenty second, uh, at twelve forty five p.m. Mountain Standard Time at the Treasure Mountain Inn Ballroom, 
and then on Tuesday, January 24th at 5.30 p.m. at the same place, but in the Crescent Room uh, yeah. with a docu-short called Busy, which I actually haven't seen. I haven't even looked forward to it. I'm really um, looking forward to just going and seeing a bunch of movies and meeting filmmakers. That's going to be the coolest thing about my week there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's an interesting <laughs> thing about covering at, as press versus um, just being somebody who attends. Um, because, um, let's see, Sundance 2021, I paid my way, I think, or got some discount or something like that. Um, and went as purely just a regular person. And I think that's probably one of the best experiences I had. But now that I've been able to do, um, accredited stuff for like Tribeca and, um, AFI Docs, AFI Fest, um, rest in peace, AFI Docs. Um, but um, it, it's been interesting how much further I've been able to just kind of be like, hey, that's a really interesting movie that not a lot of people are talking about. Yeah. In fact, um, I published this interview clip um, of this uh, inter um, of this doc uh, short. It's an all deaf thriller called Millstone that's going to be at Slam Dance. And mm -hmm. I'm not one to focus too much on analytics, but I am blown away by how many people have viewed that 30 second thing. It's like, I think within the first hour, 600, 700 people clicked on it. Just this 30 oh, second cool. clip. So I hope I, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers that somebody picks it up. Or, you know, it gets some kind of distribution if it yeah. doesn't already have it. Um, yeah, there's there's going to be a lot of cool films that they're showing kind of as a separate program down in Salt Lake at the University of Utah, right? Um, yeah. I can't remember what they're calling it. Um, but, Is it right, Unstoppable? Unstoppable, right. Yeah, um, it's in that program. Yeah, all films about and made by people, you know, with uh, quote unquote disabilities or whatever. Um, but it's going to be, that's going to be really amazing. I'm looking forward to getting to seeing some of those too. And please, you know, everybody watching, if you can't get to the festival in person, there's an amazing deal, $7.99. They can watch every film virtually, just going to the Slam Dance website and subscribing to the channel for a month, um, which is, I can't believe they're giving it away that cheap. <laughs> but it's awesome. I love that. Yeah. And I think that's really important in an age where a lot of festival tickets are like a thousand dollars. Um, yeah. and I'm just like, uh, I, I, I think I'll rather, you know, spend that on, you know, food or something like that. Uh, I think I'm good. <laughs> but, um, mm -hmm. Alex, thank you so much for joining me. I hope everyone checks it out it, again, $8, $8. I don't yeah. think you can get any better than that unless it's free. That That's the only way it gets any better. That's right. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of cool films. Um, and thanks so much. I, I enjoyed talking to you. Same here. Have a great slam dance. Mm -hmm.